It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for today, Professor Lisa Cooley, who's ARC Laureate Fellow at Australian National University, and she's also Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence um, in All Sky Astrophysics, which we call Astro 3D. So for, for this Centre of Excellence, Lisa is leading more than 200 people, scientists, um, assistants and analysts, mathematicians, students, with the goal of understanding the origins and evolution of stars and the galaxies over cosmic time. Lisa's one of our most eminent Australian astrophysicists. In 2014, she was elected to the Australian Academy of Science. She's received a very large number of awards, citations, named lectures, both nationally and internationally. And she's also a leading advocate for gender equity. And she's, she told me she's just recently published an invited review in uh, Nature on this topic. So you don't want to hear from me. Please welcome Lisa to give our keynote speech. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to tell you about Australia's strengths in space science. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to go on a romp through the universe. I'll tell you about Australia's um, fantastic discoveries using space telescopes, as well as what we're going to be doing in the future with space telescopes and some of those that we're developing ourselves in Australia at the moment. So first, why do we do astrophysics from space? Well, you can see in the pictures there that when we look at galaxies, this, for example, this is a, a colliding galaxy. When we look at galaxies or stars from ground, uh, they're, they're very fuzzy. And the problem is that our atmosphere scatters and absorbs light. And in particular, it scatters and absorbs light in the ultraviolet. It does it in the red and it does it in the infrared as well. And so we really need to go to space to be able to get a, a cleaner and a clearer view of the universe. And we also need to go to space if we wanted to look at galaxies in the UV. Why would we want to look in the UV? Well, we need to look in the UV to understand the star formation in galaxies. Stars emit most of their light in the UV if they're young. And we also want to look at supermassive black holes. We want to look at um, massive shock waves moving out of galaxies. And all these exciting events in the universe emit most of their radiation in the X-rays and the extreme UV. We also want to look in the infrared. The infrared, we're looking at dust. Many objects in the universe that are the most exciting are also the dustiest objects. Colliding galaxies, if we want to look in their centre, what's happening in the centres of those galaxies? Very, very dusty. Sometimes we can't even see in the optical what's happening, hiding supermassive black holes. And so we've been needing to go to space for a long time, and we now have a large number of space telescopes uh, out there which cover the whole wavelength range from the gamma ray to the ultraviolet to visible infrared microwave as well as radio. And so astronomers in Australia are using a plethora of space telescopes. We combine those with the largest telescopes on ground and there's a couple, there's a few of them on there but it's actually a larger number of ground-based telescopes than are on this image. And in Australia we have access to an excellent range of ground-based telescopes uh, to, in to obtain data in combination with the space telescopes. And these ground-based telescopes that we use are mostly in Chile or in Hawaii, and that's where the best ground-based telescopes are in the world because they're on high mountains with very clear atmosphere and uh, very little cloud cover. And so we're using a combination of telescopes to understand how the universe evolves, how galaxies evolve, and how stars and planets form and evolve. Now, I'm going to have a talk to you about the periodic table because a lot of the work that Australian astronomers have done uh, is to do with understanding the evolution of the chemical elements. Now, you're all familiar with the periodic table, uh, many elements in the periodic table. Now, the astronomers, until very, very recently, the astronomers have had a different periodic table. So I'm going to show you the astronomers' periodic table. So we start here, looks like this. We've got hydrogen, we have helium, Everything else, metals. <laughs> this is true. So until very recently, uh, we've called everything else in the universe metals. And part of that is because it's very difficult to observe them. 
In the optical range, we can see hydrogen lines. Sometimes we can see nitrogen and sometimes we can see sulfur. But we're, it's actually very hard for us to understand the amount of elements just based on the optical lines because we're not looking at all of the lines. We're just looking at a small fraction. Uh, but however, recently with combination of space and ground-based telescopes, Australian astronomers have, are really leading the way in understanding the evolution, the formation and the evolution of the chemical elements. And so here's an example of what we've been doing in Australian astronomy. This is just in the past few years. We're trying to understand now the evolution of the building blocks of the universe, the carbon and the nitrogen and the oxygen in the universe. And so we're trying to track that across 13 billion years of cosmic time. We're starting with the first stars in the universe and we'd like to discover the first stars in the universe. And in fact, Australians have discovered the three most pristine earliest stars in the universe, top three. And these stars, we think, are very close to being the first stars in the universe. The most pristine star, which is the oldest star discovered, is 13.6 billion years old. And that star, we think, has so few chemical elements in it that it's only had one supernova before it. And so this is very, very close to the Big Bang. And we think in the, in the coming years, probably if you keep an eye on the, the media and the press releases, in the coming two to three years, I expect that we'll, be, we'll find the record, real record breaker, the first star in the universe. And so this is being done on the Siding Springs Telescope uh, Sky Mapper. This is out in Coonabarabran in combination with Space Telescope Gaia. We're also trying to discover the very first galaxies in the universe, and we can actually see back 12 to 13 billion years ago to discover candidate first galaxies. And to do that, we're using the Hubble Space Telescope, and we have Australian astronomers with guaranteed time on the Hubble Space Telescope. And in fact, our astronomer, Michaeli Trenti at University of Melbourne, has the largest amount of guaranteed time on the Hubble Space Telescope to observe the first galaxies. Very big program called the Borg Survey. We're also combining those observations with the very large telescope spectroscopy because we need to understand the chemical elements in those galaxies. And then finally, we're tracking galaxy evolution across cosmic time, and we're doing that using a combination of the very large telescopes in Hawaii, uh, Keck, in, uh, sorry, Keck in Hawaii, the very large telescopes in Chile, as well as our local uh, SAMI instrument on the Anglo-Australian telescope in Coonabarabran. So we're using the space telescopes to view parts of galaxies and stars we can't see from ground, and then we use the ground telescopes where we need to go deep. We need a large collecting area to look for the very faintest things, and so that's why we're going for the ground. Now, we're also doing a very exciting program, and Australian astronomers are also leading the way in this, and it's called Galactic Archaeology. And Australian astronomers have formed a large team, and they're obtaining high-resolution ob spectroscopic observations of a million stars in the Milky Way, which have been discovered with the Gaia satellite. So every time the Gaia satellite puts out a new data set, they mine it very, very quickly, and then quickly line them up for observations on the Anglo-Australian telescope, which has the highest resolution spectrograph in the world. Now, I was just having a science meeting with them yesterday because we need to know how well everybody's progressing in our Astro 3D Centre of Excellence. And I asked them, I said, is there any alternative? What if uh, the instrument's not working? What are we going to do? And they said, there isn't any alternative. We've got to make sure that the Anglo-Australian Observatory keeps working and that this Hermes instrument is uh, keeps working. We're halfway there. We think that if we can observe a million stars in the Milky Way, that we could actually track back where they all originally formed. Because we know that stars form together in clusters like this, and that over time they disperse, they move around. So now it's very difficult to figure out where stars were born, but their chemical elements and their ages are the same. And you can find twins of stars and triplets of stars and quadruplets of stars. And if we find a million of them, the theoretical models say, we'll be able to trace back and elucidate the history of the Milky Way. So imagine seeing an image of the Milky Way now, all these stars in it, and then it rolling, the movie rolling back in time and the stars all moving around to the way the Milky Way was when it first formed. That's how exciting this is. And so this is going to happen in the next two or three years. So keep an eye out for results from that. 
Now, this is a very recent discovery made by that team. So this is by Joss Bland Hawthorne, who's at the University of Sydney within the Galactic Archaeology team. And he used images from the Hubble Space Telescope to look at chemical elements which are very, very high ionisation. Ionisation means that you've got an extreme amount of radiation and they're ripping electrons off the atoms around them, large amount of electrons being ripped off. And that means that you've got very uh, exciting radiation. And he saw this very far out from the Milky Way centre. And it, the only way you could get such high energies far out from the Milky Way centre is if you had a massive impact and it had to have been 200,000 light years away from the centre. Only one thing that makes that, that's a supermassive black hole blowing out material. We actually see those happening in other galaxies, but we thought our galaxy was a nice, quiet, pristine place. This suggests that our, the centre of our galaxy is actually much more active than we thought, and that the supermassive black hole in the centre turns on and off and occasionally blows out material. Fortunately, we're in the spiral arms. The material is not blowing, at, not blowing out into the spiral arms. It's actually perpendicular to the, our disk of the Milky Way. Uh, but this is a very exciting result and the first time uh, we've understood better the supermassive black hole in the centre of our own Milky Way galaxy. Australian astronomers are also using space telescopes to understand the evolution of galaxies, including spiral galaxies like our own Milky Way. So these images here are from the Hubble Space Telescope and they show you what galaxies look like from 7 to 10 billion years ago, which you can see they actually don't look like galaxies today. They don't have spiral arms like our Milky Way, most of them. They're very clumpy and lumpy and they've got really big regions of star formation. And then three to seven billion years ago, the galaxies are looking a little bit more like spiral galaxies that we have today, but they're still more lumpy and clumpy. And then from the present to three billion years ago, the galaxies are now forming this diffuse gas spiral arm structures that we see in our own Milky Way and neighboring spiral galaxies. So we need to understand how our Milky Way formed and evolved and our galaxies like our own Milky Way formed and evolved. Uh, to try to understand how galaxies like our Milky Way formed and evolved, we need to understand how hundreds or ideally thousands of galaxies evolve with time. And we can actually take snapshots of them. We look back in time because the light takes billions of years to reach us. And we can actually track back how the galaxies evolved. And astronomers at the moment are trying to understand how galaxies built across the whole universe. And we're using a clever technique. This technique was proposed by Einstein, and he said that if you take a massive, massive object in the universe, then the light will bend around it like a refracting telescope or like a magnifying glass, and it will actually magnify the light in, in luminosity, brightness, and it's also going to magnify it on the side, so it's going to make an image look bigger. This does happen. We actually see this and uh, Australian astronomers are leading the way in this, both theoretically as well as uh, through observations. And so we're looking at the biggest clusters of galaxies, and this is some work that I, I myself have been involved in as well. Massive clusters of galaxies are the biggest things in the universe, and they've got so much mass and so much dark matter in them that the light is bent tremendously around them, and we can see this happening. And that means that the light, the brightness of the galaxies behind them is amplified by 10 to 30 times. There's one that's amplified 50 times. And so we can see distant galaxies that we'd never be able to see without this technique, gravitational lensing. It's a bit like having a telescope the size of many galaxies across. And so we're in Astro 3D, we're combining the Hubble Space Telescope images of massive galaxy clusters to detect those background galaxies. And then we're looking at these galaxies with the very large telescope in Chile, and that's to detect the spectroscopy of those galaxies, which tells us about the chemical elements, where it is, and also uh, the mass and how the galaxies are moving. We're then combining that with observations from the nearby universe with the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Telescope, as well as the SAMI and Hector instruments on the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Now I'm going to show you what gravitational lensing does. Some of you here are from the Australian Academy of Science and you'll like this one. Uh, this is the Shine Dome. And I'm going to put a supermassive black hole, actually a quasar, in front of it and you can see what happens. There we are. 
Um, I'm glad the architects didn't build it quite like that. What we have here, what you're looking at here is uh, two images of the academy. There's one upside down and one the right side up and all the lights being bent around and until very recently we hadn't been able to correct for this. Our galaxies look the same. The light gets bent around and we see multiple images and so it looks much like this very, um, this purple image here where the galaxy's light is pulled apart and shifted around but now we have very good supercomputers and we're able to model how this bending happens and we're actually able to correct for it very, very well and make amazing discoveries. So this is a, a young astronomer, Chen Chen Yuan, who's, at, who's an Astro 3D fellow at Swinburne University and she discovered the most distant spiral galaxy in the universe. And here it is here, there's an image, there's actually two of them, she's got two spiral galaxies and these galaxies are eight billion years old and this is actually earlier than is predicted by theoretical models of galaxy formation. Theoretical models of galaxy formation said spiral arms shouldn't begin forming until much later. So this is uh, causing tension with the theoretical models and uh, I think they need to go a bit back and uh, think about <laughs> how spiral arms formed. Now astronomers are also now developing cube satellites. And so here's one example. This is um, University of Melbourne astronomer Michaeli Trenti. He's leading an international team, including several Australian universities as well as international universities to build a, a miniature space telescope. And you can see here where the arrow is, uh, that's the actual size of this telescope called Skyhopper compared to the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's really, really tiny but it's okay because we, it's for very dedicated science and it's science that can't be done on these larger telescopes. So this has rapid response capabilities. If you try to point Hubble very quickly at something, it's gonna take a little while. The gyroscopes have gotta move it around. This little thing can just go and start pointing. This is very important because the Skyhopper telescope is trying to look at its supernova and the first stars and galaxies, as well as extraterrestrial planets. And some of these, um, the, if we're looking for supernova from first stars or early galaxies, these happen very quickly and you wanna quickly go and have a look at them. We also have a exciting project, which is in uh, collaboration with Google. And Google actually approached Australian astronomers and said, hey, we're gonna be putting up all these balloons and Google is putting up balloons all over the world and lots of them all over Australia. And this is to provide internet to regional areas which don't have internet access at the moment. And so these are balloons, they go up to the stratosphere and they are able to have a telescope on them. They said, would you like to have telescopes on them? And we said, yes, please, that'd be good. And this is a design of the telescope. So it's around, you know, a metre a metre to half a metre big, just sits on the bottom of the balloon. And this is going to be amazing because it's going to be, it's in the UV. So we're going to be able to look at the very exciting radiation from the core collapse supernova. So here's a simulation of a core collapse supernova. The star runs out of, of fuel and then the core actually collapses in on itself, bounces back and expands right out. So it's blowing all of its outer materials out into space. And the brightness of this thing goes up and up and up as it expands out into space. And it's mostly observable in the X-rays and the ultraviolet. If we want to really understand these, and they produce gamma ray bursts, which are very exciting events, and we think we might be able to use them to understand the size of the universe and perhaps something about dark energy, but we need to understand more about these in the UV and the X-rays. We can't do it from ground, so these, these telescopes will be ideal. Okay, and in my last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about some of the other work that astronomers are doing, which involves uh, space satellite uh, testing as well as some of our laser optics. So at ANU, we have an in-space satellite testing facility, and the, you can see there's a thing called Wombat there that um, depressurizes and uh, simulates the space environment. We have an anechoic chamber for testing the signals, sending signals through space, and we also have a lab for developing instrumentation and satellite um, technology. And so this in, in, in space, we're doing developing a, a space debris tracking system using lasers. So here is an image of 
what we believe is the, all the space debris around the Earth. You can barely see the Earth because of all the space debris. So these are all, you know, many of these are uh, pieces or, or entire old satellites that are no longer being used. There's a tremendous amount of stuff out there. It's actually going to become hard in the coming years to launch new uh, satellites because of all these other debris there. So we're using lasers to track where they are so we have a very good picture of where they are and ultimately to deorbit them. And finally, we're developing uh, the first optical ground station laser communications network, and that's in combination with New Zealand. And there's a lot of advantage for, advantages for this. Um, I can't go into detail, unfortunately, uh, because I want to show, end with what's the future for astronomy in the next few years. So this is the James Webb Space Telescope due to launch in March 2021 and we're currently preparing for it and both myself and some of the other Australian astronomers have got uh, early release time so we have time that's going to be observed on for discovering distant galaxies in the universe and we're very excited by this telescope and here it is it's launched and it's now has to unfold and this terrifies me when it's unfolding because there's so many moving parts have to have to come out here we hope it's going to work these are the the sun shields so you've got to shield the instrument from the extreme radiation from the sun otherwise it burns out your detectors and they're rolling out very slowly they're all folded up in there like an accordion and because the sun shields get very hot you actually have to cool them down. You can't have one big one. You actually have to have lots of them. And so they're all going to unfold and then expand out. And there's airflow between them, which allows them to cool down. Now the, the secondary mirror comes out. And so the light comes down. It bounces off that big mirror onto the secondary mirror at the end of the poles and then back into the instruments which are inside the boxes there. And this is an infrared telescope. So it's, going to, it's designed specifically to look at the very, very distant universe, look for the first stars and the first galaxies, and it's also aiming to look at um, the atmospheres on other planets around other stars and to see if there's life. Okay, that's all. Thank you.